Welcome, everybody. I'm Sharon McConnell, and we're glad you're with us as we talk to Deb Hickok, who is uh, leaving uh, Explore Fairbanks as the CEO this June. Um, she's been with Explore Fairbanks for 21 years, and she's really been a driving force for the visitor industry. Uh, for example, changing the perception of Fairbanks uh, so to make it a tourist destination year-round. Uh, Deb has also collaborated with other organizations to bring large events to Fairbanks, including the Alaska Federation and Natives Convention. She joins us now to talk about her career and her experiences and to reflect on the various projects that she played a leadership role in, such as the building of the Morris Thompson Culture and Visitors Center. So we're so glad you're here, Deb. And I guess to start it off, maybe just a little bit of background, um, where you're from originally. Sure, thanks, Sharon, and it's great to be here with you. Um, I think this is the longest that, we've, that we're talking to each other <laughs> in a while because we're both so busy. But yeah, I was... Um, Raised in New York City, uh, in Staten Island, which was really not, um, they didn't think they were part of the city. We always called Manhattan the city. And uh, we had woods behind our house, and we got poison ivy, and we picked blackberries. And so it was a little different lifestyle than um, for being a New York City resident. And then... Um, I went to school in upstate New York, and uh, during that period, my parents retired to the Poconos. And then I traveled around, um, lived in Boston, lived in uh, Vermont, the Northeast Kingdom, uh, lived in upstate New York. And then um, eventually I ended up back in the Poconos. And um, my dad uh, was kind of didn't like some of the fields I had been in. I tried the health field. It wasn't my thing. Um, and my dad saw this job for the Pocono Mountains Vacation Bureau, and that was in 1982. And I, and I applied for the job, and I got it, and boy, I just took to tourism. I just uh, loved promoting tourism. There's, uh, there's such um, a lot of strategy that's needed, and you need to understand how other destinations promote themselves. And then you really have to understand the sense of place of uh, what of the destination that you're promoting. So it just com combines a lot. And you have to be crafty, too, in your strategy. You know, you have to be, uh, we call it co-opetition. So we cooperate with other destinations, but we compete with them, too. So, so the dynamics of it, I loved. I traveled a lot um, those first years, which, you know, I was young. And it was just, I worked hard, and I played hard. And it was just a really great period. So. I worked for the Pocono Mountains Vacation Bureau, and I specialized in meetings and conventions and group travel. And then I went to the state of Pennsylvania Tourism Department, uh, where I was the public relations manager. And then I headed up my own organization in Bucks County and had my own business for a few years, too. And um, in 1999, I was looking for something different. And uh, I applied for the job here in Fairbanks and got it. And had been you ever, ever been since. to Alaska before? No, I hadn't. And I think I'm different from a lot of uh, people who migrated to Alaska in the sense that I didn't have this burning desire that I wanted to live in Alaska, but I wanted something really, really different. So that's what really... Um, and after I interviewed, and I loved the people that I interviewed with. They were very down-to-earth. Um, the organization, they were at a juncture where they really wanted change. They really wanted the organization to do something different and uh, move forward, and that really appealed to me. And then I thought, Alaska, well, that is really different. <laughs> so I, that checked all the boxes. And um, at the time, uh, my daughter was four years old, um, so um, I packed her up. Um, I drove a 24-foot truck and hauled my Toyota and had a four-year-old and oh we took goodness. a two-week uh, journey to Alaska. Yeah. What are some of the early memories you have of first arriving in Fairbanks where you're going to be working? What was your first impression? Yeah, well, you know, the job, I had been in tourism destination marketing for so long that I really acclimated quickly to the job. And of course, you want to know the players and you want to get a much better feel for the target markets. But in terms of lifestyle, um, you know, we were quickly heading into winter by the time we got here. And it's, it was very much like winter back east. You know, I'd go to work in the dark and I'd come home in the dark. So to me, that wasn't ever a problem. And I came from, a, from an environment of winter. My whole life um, was in Northeast United States. So that wasn't an issue. But I remember um, 
we closed on the house like around Halloween. And I remember getting home at night and I just had this fleeting sensation of eeriness and I, I could never put my finger on it. And then one night we got home and getting out of the car and the wind was blowing. I was like, ah, that's it. It's been the absence of wind mm -hmm. that gave me that feeling because I had not lived in a place that was so as windless as Fairbanks. So the darkness didn't get to you then no. when you got here? What about all the snow that we have and the no. cold temperatures? No, and I like the snow here much better than back east because um, back east it started to be so variable. So one day you'd be shoveling very wet snow and exhausted, and then it'd be melted two or three days later. Or then there'd be sleet another day and icy, and then it'd be really warm. So the, I didn't like the, the variable weather. Um, but here it was very consistent. You knew what to expect, and you were ready for it. So I just got to ask you, Deb, because coming from the East Coast all the way up here to Fairbanks with your daughter, what did your family say? Uh, they were so angry with me. <laughs> they really were. Well, at the time, my mother and father were both dead by then, so um, I don't think I ever would have left them. Uh, but I did leave aunts and uncles, a lot of cousins, um, good friends, um, yeah, it was a little crazy, I guess, and um, they were angry, and they and they said, well, when you move back, that was, and then finally they gave up maybe after about seven or eight years <laughs> saying that. Yeah. Asking you to come home. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, and I, we made a studious effort to go back once a year for a while until I realized that we really did need a vacation. Mm -hmm. I think everybody feels that way at some <laughs> point in time after they've moved here. Vacations are a lot of work when you're visiting all your family and yeah. friends, um, yeah, back east, so. So then we ended up maybe going back every other year. Wow. So when you first came up here, um, you said they were asking for change, and it is a big undertaking to really promote, you know, for what people, I guess, back then perceived as a desolate, cold place. <laughs> what were the goals of Explore Fairbanks? Um, well, it wasn't called Explore Fairbanks back then, but what were the goals back then for you as the, the head of the organization? Yeah, you know, they gave me a lot of freedom from day one. And um, I'm not the type to hit people over the head with change. You know, I just think the most lasting change is something that's strategic and thought out and gradual, and so it sticks. And so one of my first thoughts in the back of my head was, well, it's winter about eight months out of the year, but we're not really promoting it. And I had come from destinations like the Poconos is a four season resort region. And so in the state of Pennsylvania, we promoted winter just like we did the other seasons. And so for me, it was just a natural part of the cell um, for a destination, but it wasn't quite here. As a matter of fact, it was a little bit controversial um, to be spending any money to develop winter. So instead of just saying, okay, now we're gonna market winter, uh, for, we formed a group of individuals and we sort of sequestered ourselves off and on as a work group through a winter and we called it Mush On with Winter Tourism and we just um, developed a strategy. And one of the first things was we already had some preformed winter travel, which was the Japanese market at China Hot Springs. So we knew that there was interest there and one of our goals was to secure direct charters from Japan. And um, well, within five years, after a lot of no's and some you know, spits and sputters, um, we did get our first charters uh, from Japan in 2004, I think. Mm -hmm. so. um, what were some of the selling points you know, that you really yeah. marketed about folks coming in? Well, definitely here? the Aurora is a draw. And, um, and when we first start, and we've tested that number of times, what, what do people respond to? And it's the, the Aurora is really, and even that, you know, in the beginning, we were only seen as an Aurora destination in winter, and then we gradually matured that and expanded that because uh, really from mid-August to mid-April, you can see the Aurora, and so that straddles three seasons, so that gave us a much broader time period to sell. And we also, at one point in time, we gave it dates because one of our partners says, you know, it's a little squishy for people to plan their vacation by saying mid-August, so mm -hmm. we gave it dates April, August 21 to April 21. 
And you know, being a resident here, you don't just turn on the lights <laughs> August 21. And, you, know, you can pretty much yeah. see it a week before and you know, a week after that, uh, that in April. Uh, but it really does help visitors plan. Uh, and um, so that's, you know, so it's matured over the years of how we've thought of the Aurora. Um, but, but after testing it. that is still the big it, selling point, though. Yeah, it is um, in the sense, so when we have ads, especially now at digital advertising, you only have a few seconds of the viewer's time. So um, we've tested, and the Aurora is what captures them, may, may make them pause for a few minutes to click on your ad. Um, so we've continued to use that. Mm -hmm. So when you first came up here, what were some of the weaknesses and the strengths that you saw in the tourism industry for not only Fairbanks, but for interior Alaska? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, certainly, um, you know, to put all your eggs in one basket, which is a summer, and uh, being heavily reliant on one cr sector, the cruise sector, in one way is a good thing because it provides a great foundation. On, and But all the businesses were making their money uh, in the summer and then sort of, live, you know, especially hotels where they were living in the red for the rest of the year and living off the fat of the summer. So to try to even that out and... Um, look at some other uh, strategies that would, you know, even out that cell um, throughout the year. And of course, summer continues to be our highest volume and our most profitable season, and we continue to promote that. We still spend most of our money uh, on promoting that season. And um, and we, we talk about the Midnight Sun, too. That's another of our brand pillars. But um, in general, uh, we tried to broaden out that. And meetings and conventions is part of that, too. You know, we, got, we were looking for some uh, big meetings in order to help those periods in the spring and mm -hmm. fall also. So if I can back up just a little bit. Mm -hmm. You talked about when you first got here, of course, Chena Hot Springs was a destination. Um, and as you've increased your marketing and really put out more of the, um, you know, Northern Lights viewing and you saw businesses grow because of that, what are some of the other industries, um, uh, hot selling points, if you will, was dog machine, is that one, or skiing? Can you just talk about some of those components that we've seen grow over the years? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think uh, dog machine has been the most visible one. And um, it was kind of funny when we were going after the charters, there were some naysayers, oh, you'll never be able to get charters. And we were very low-keyed about it. I don't like to talk about something until we get get it done, you know. And but then when we got the charters and we secured them, they were 747s at first. And they and people said, well, we're never going to be able to handle a plane load of, you know, 747. And what we found was we had a few dog mushers and they united with each other and they worked together and they were able to handle a higher volume. And boy, did they use their entrepreneurial, uh, you know, know-how and just figured out how you can take elderly Japanese people around in a circle and, and gear them up so they're nice and warm. So that, I think that one ha was the most visible. But over the years, we've seen ice fishing grow and become popular, ice fishing and uh, aurora viewing. We have every combination of aurora viewing. We have aurora chasers, so you can be in a van, and they'll take you from place to place, or they'll kind of figure out what the place is. We have aurora lodges. Um, that we have aurora photographers that you know people that specialize in teaching you how to photograph the aurora so i think that's had multiple growth spurts too uh snow machining that's um now we have a stable base of snow machining um if that's offered out of the skiing cross-country skiing is uh, a nice activity for people to try that haven't been able to do that and we do talk about the downhill skiing. And I think people like the idea that they can say that they skied in, um, you know, Fairbanks, Alaska. Um, so that's a, that's a cool part of it, too. Mm -hmm. And, of course, ice sculpture. So March is our busiest winter month. And for a variety of reasons, the temperatures tend to be a little milder. And then there's lots to do um, outside. And then you have, um, you know, the ice sculptures, too, that mm -hmm. adds to that cell. So you talked about the Japanese coming over, building that base. <clears throat> What were some of uh, you have you seen a growth in the other countries like Europeans coming over, making this a yeah. destination? Actually, even mm -hmm. then, and it continues to be the the most of our winter travelers and Aurora season travelers are domestic travelers, but the uh, the 
Asian groups tend to be more visible, right? When they're moving around in the community because they move in large groups. So what's really has grown up until the pandemic period was um, uh, Chinese travelers. And that's something that we really worked on too. Um, we have a contractual relationship with uh, somebody that rep a company that represents us in China. Uh, and they were doing a full-fledged marketing program for us there. Uh, we've had to curtail that during the pandemic, but we hope to revitalize that um, you know, as soon as the borders open up more for international travel. So, so yeah, for, for winter, um, we see the European market a little bit in winter. We mostly see them in the summer. They tend to rent IV, RVs and take longer vacations and travel around the state and travel here too. Mm -hmm. um, but it's one of our key markets, Australia and New Zealand key markets too. Wow, really? Yeah. <laughs> oh, goodness. Yeah, mostly for the summer, but we do see them coming because they, they see the southern lights and they want to experience the northern lights. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about the pandemic and how that's impacted the yeah. organization in a little bit. But, um, you know, you talked about the jets, and I'm assuming, you know, you've uh, worked very closely with the cruise industry, too. Yes, Can we you do. you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, we do. And we have a program. So most cruises are sold through travel advisors. It used to be called travel agents, and now they call themselves travel advisors. So we have an active program with them. We have um, online training for them, too, and we have a certification that they can get. And the cruise is an important part of that. Um, of course, the cruise companies do a lot of their own marketing. So we're, we're that's really great for Alaska that... Um, we have Alaskan dollars being spent to market, but also the cruise dollars to be able to market. And, you know, for people to come on a land tour to Fairbanks, it means uh, a bigger investment of time and money. So it's um, a more intensive sell than taking, you know, a round trip cruise uh, in the Gulf of Alaska uh, to to take the cruise and then to do the land tour. Um, so that's something that we work on and we um, call ourselves the farthest north port um, for cruises and uh, that's and we we you know really talk about and of course Denali is the kingpin um, to all of that and our right. proximity to Denali is is great. Um, and we have great summer attractions, so we're able to be, you know, talk about that. So has the cruise industry, the, that combo, the cruise and then coming up here, has that grown over the years? It has, and, and it, it varies from year to year because itineraries change, so it really does change. For a while, especially after a recession, there was a lot direct to Denali because people couldn't afford as long of a trip. And then we saw it grow um, after the Great Recession more recently. Um, so the land tours to Fairbanks became um, became more popular because people had more time and money to spend. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it has varied over the years. And at one point in time, it was maybe about 56% of our summer business. And the most recent study we've had, which the state does, it's a little outdated, but it was 41%. And part of that is I think we've grown the independent travel. And when we say independent, we mean independent individuals as well as group travel. So mm -hmm. we've been able to grow that too. Mm -hmm. So the pandemic has affected everybody. And how have you dealt with that within your organization? Yeah, it's horrible. You, it's you been horrible. Huge <laughs> blow to you, you know? Yeah, it's, well, you know, it start, when it started in March um, of 2020, I think we were all in disbelief. And uh, as I mentioned, March is our busiest winter month. So we were all cranking, we had a record uh, January and February, too. Our, we had record hotel motel taxes with January and February, uh, right before March of 2020. Uh, record airport arrivals and departures. So we were on a roll, and we were headed for our best year ever. Um, in winter, and, and we believed in summer. And then it gradually started falling apart. People were canceling their trips. And at first, we were in disbelief. And we hung on for a long time. Like, we kept the Morris Thompson Cultural and Visitor Center open, I think we were the last one standing. And it was one business that we work with and us. And finally, I said to him, we, we got to shut down. He said, I'm, sh I'm shutting down too. Okay. And, um, and then we just dealt with it because we knew right away um, the majority of our budget comes from hotel motel taxes that are reinvested into our marketing budget. And we knew that that was going to decline. So we slashed our budget right away. Um, we had to let five people go, um, 
and then we cut the budget from uh, about 4.2 million to 2.9 million, and all of the remaining staff um, got pay cuts. Um, so that's how we started. That was all done by April. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> so it was very intense, very stressful. But you are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel now. Well, yeah, we're, things are getting better for sure. Um, vaccinations have made a real big difference. Uh, but we still have the cruise industry right now. We, just, they, you know, we don't know if it's going to happen. There's a big push now between the Canadian cl border closure and the CDC requirements. Those are two huge obstacles for the cruise industry. And um, then, of course, Canada controls the border, too, for us. And that's a, usually about 10% of our summer business. So there's 51% of our summer business that's in the Canadian government's hands mm -hmm. uh, in their decision. So we're just, and they just extended the border uh, um, closure, closure today um, again. So, so yeah, and then, so our hope is independent travel. And we have actually 33% more air capacity this summer than we did in summer of 2019. Really? So what some of the airlines are doing, particularly the larger ones, is since they can't do long-haul destinations overseas, they're treating Alaska as the long-haul destination. So our airport will have 33% more capacity. Now the, the challenge is to fill those seats. Wow. Well... You mentioned the Morris Thompson Cultural and Visitor Center. You were a leader. You played a leadership role in the development. I mean, even the idea of this center. In fact, this is where we're at right now is in the auditorium of the Morris Thompson Center. Can you just talk about that idea that came up? How did it come about to have these partners and this building built? Well, actually, the idea happened before my time. And so I think the first meeting between, between Alaska Public Lands Information Center and what was then Fairbanks Convention and Visitors Bureau was in um, 1997. And uh, I'll, I'll call it Explore, uh, Fairbanks Convention, <laughs> Explore Fairbanks, because that's our name now. But um, so Explore Fairbanks uh, had the Log Cabin Visitor Center um, down to, in downtown overlooking the Chena River. And then we had our marketing offices in the Key Bank Building. And then Alaska Public Lands Information Center, APLIC, which was run by the National Park Service, was just a, a block down. And we found ourselves constantly pointing to each other. So uh, people would come and want to know more in-depth information about exploring the outdoors. So we would send them to APLIC. And then APLIC would, uh, couldn't refer private businesses. They're not allowed as a federal agency. So they would refer people to us and how about private businesses that could help them access the wilderness. So there was synergy there already. And both of us, uh, our, our current, our facilities at the time were inadequate. Um, so we had to close our bathrooms down because they were in the basement and we couldn't keep track of people there. And Apple didn't have any parking where they were. So we had, they had a meeting in 1997 before I got there about maybe combining uh, into one building. And then meanwhile, on a separate track, was Town and Chiefs Conference and um, the idea of a cultural center and a cultural program. And at, at the point in time, there was a grant that was secured by the city of Fairbanks to research this further. And it was between APLIC and uh, Explore Fairbanks, but then TCC joined in. And then a really important juncture was we uh, separately we were approaching to Senator Stevens uh, to see if he could possibly help with funding. And he said, if you come together, the three entities, and you um, work on a building together and name it after my good friend Morris Thompson, then um, I will help you find funding. And uh, that's how the partnership was really born, was through Senator Stevens. And then through TCC, Danakanaga came mm -hmm. on board too and for the elder program. As you look back over the development of the center, I mean, it's been a number of years now. It just, it's gone by so fast. Yeah. Um, we were just talking earlier about the groundbreaking ceremony and uh, how many years have we been here, you know? And um, uh, how have you seen that partnership being beneficial? I mean, you talked a little bit about, you know, the synergy, but what have you seen over the years here at the center? Yeah, when I look back, I mean, the building of the building together was just incredible. It was an incredible experience. It was hard work. I mean, we spent a lot of hours and 
every square inch of the building and the interpretive exhibits were decided by a group process. So we all agreed. It had it was a throughout the whole process. So it was just and we had players that changed in that process. I was the most consistent player in terms of the, the partners. I, I, I was the one that had the longevity through that 10 years where we were planning the building. So that, I think, really solidified you know, um, a partnership. And we really understood each other. We really understood what we were looking for in the building and what we hoped to get out of and how we would work together. I have to be honest, once we moved in together, it was harder because living together, it's sort of like planning a marriage, right? And everybody's all excited. But then living together, the reality of that might be a little bit different, right? right. And you have to work on your personality nuances. And I, I feel like that, that was sort of the same way. And we all came from different corporate cultures in terms of how we were going to function. So I think there was, um, you know, sort of a, a, a more challenging couple of first years um, when we all moved in together and we're trying to figure out how we all would work. And I think we've gotten it um, to a really good point that we all used our strengths. And um, we all have a shared interest in seeing TCC cultural programs succeed. And, you know, when we came into the building, APLIC and the National Park Service had a very um, mature program of what they did. Explore Fairbanks, we had a very mature program. So it was TCC cultural programs that was starting from the ground up. And and we all realized that and we wanted to help support that in any way that, that we could. Um, so I think that, and that still be, is a goal, I think, of the organization. And of course, Janakanaga had a, had a mature program too when you got here. Right. And, um, and of course, Alaska Geographic came in with APLIC and they, they had operated as a store, as a nonprofit store for quite a while. So it was really TCC cultural programs that uh, we wanted to see rise up so in the when, building. When we're talking about the center, your organization um, tracks the number of visitors that come through. Um, what were, how, what have the numbers been like? What's the peak number? And yeah, good question. It's over a hundred thousand. I think we had a hundred and I don't know the exact number. So. Before the pandemic and the year before the pandemic, it was well over 100,000 that we had come through mm -hmm. the doors. Wow. Yeah. What are some of your fondest memories of this center when you think about it? You know, all that's gone on here in these uh, walls, if you will, you know. Yeah, I think, I think each of the partners in their own way makes the building come alive. Um, from the beginning, we really wanted this to be a gathering place for local people, too. And we see a lot of people that come in with their families and just wander through the exhibits. And, uh, of course, visiting friends and relatives always get, you know, get brought in, too. Um, so I, I think that gathering place, uh, not only for visitors, but for locals, has been a really important part of that. Um, and. Uh, and that, and that has been realized and continues to be realized. Of course, you always have the local who said, I still bump into people who say, I've never been in that building. And I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> we've been there almost 12 years now, yeah. but you can, you can come on in, you know, please come. So this um, model of partnership of, um, you know, all the organizations getting together under run roof, um, <clears throat> how common is that uh, within Alaska or even maybe the nation? It's very uncommon, and um, so, for example, the National Park Service, they have a lot of partnerships, um, but typically, my understanding is that it's with other federal and state agencies. That's what APLIC is, right? It's a consortium of federal and state land management agencies. So to have a relationship, though, under one roof with um, an uh, indigenous nonprofit and a marketing organization, um, and an elders nonprofit is uh, highly unusual, I think, for them. And certainly for an organization like ours, it's very unusual. Mm -hmm. I know um, I know some of the folks, the tourists that come through the center, they'll come to Danakanaga's office and they think we're part of the exhibit because we have a lot of pictures on our walls and we have showcases of beadwork and, and traditional regalia from, from our elders. And we're always happy to talk with them. And sometimes if the elders are there, they'll give a first-hand, you know, story to the tourists and, and talk to them. But, um, you know, 
all these partners in this building, I think it is very beneficial. Um, and I think it works pretty good. Um, yeah. I do want to talk to you a little bit, Deb, about uh, one initiative that you played a very key role in is bringing the Alaska Federation of Natives Convention to Fairbanks. I mean, that was a big thing. I mean, that convention brings over $5 million or more, um, brings in countless number of people in for the convention. Um, what made you think of that? I mean, what made you undertake that? Yeah, that was an interesting story. And um, we were actually, at one point in time, a city council member said to us, why don't we host AFN? You know, um, what's the problem there? So I had our, our meetings conventions director at the time take a look at the specs for uh, AFN. And she determined that we just couldn't fit it in our community because we don't have a bona fide convention center. Um, and uh, so I, I went back to the city council member and said, you know, we just can't handle it. Um, but then AFN actually approached us and uh, they approached Juno and Fairbanks and said, you know, we've been meeting in Anchorage for a long time and we feel that we don't have a special place there that we're kind of taken for granted. So we'd like to start rotating um, the meeting around. So by then we had a, a different person as meeting convention director, Jennifer Jolis. And Jennifer, we, we got a hold of the specs and Jennifer took a look at it and she came to me and she said, you know, I think we can make this work. So she used some ingenuity and we sat down and she described to me how it would work and she convinced me that yes, it would work. And uh, so we ended up uh, bidding for the event and Juno backed out because Juno just didn't have the hotel rooms to be able to accommodate that. For us, it wasn't the hotel rooms. We had plenty of hotel rooms, um, but it was actually the event itself, you know, uh, making the Carlson Center fit as a convention center when it's not really a convention center. And AFN works because the main assembly is, uses one big room, which is really unusual for a convention that size. Normally there's lots and lots of breakout rooms, but AFN uh, doesn't really have it like that. So anyway, we knew that we couldn't do it on our own. So we immediately went to the mayor and, um, and then we thought, you know, we need a committee. And um, before we knew it, uh, we had a community committee, uh, and everybody was jazzed and uh, worked together. And uh, our first, the first AFN. Oh, and we did have some naysayers about it too, because back in 1988, I think it was, AFN met in Fairbanks, and apparently the logistical part of it did not go well at all. It was in the Big Depper. And um, when this came about, we had people, including hoteliers. There was a big group of hoteliers that met once and said, to to me, Jennifer and I, we, we can't do this. We can't handle it. And Jennifer explained how we would. And I said, we're doing this. We have community support and we're doing it. And that was the end of the discussion and we just did it. And it, so anyway, I think we've hosted like six times since 2005 now. Mm -hmm. I know the one comment I always hear <clears throat> about the convention being here in Fairbanks is the friendliness of everybody here in the community wanting to help everyone, and they really look forward to that hospitality. So I just got to say you did a wonderful job in, in bringing that convention and having everybody work together and create that environment for the uh, delegates and participants of the convention. Well, thank you. But it, it, took a, it, it takes a village for sure. You know, it was a collaboration, and uh, everybody pulled their own weight. You know, everybody who said they were going to do so. And I've seen that mature, too. We've gotten better and better over the years the volunteers are trained you know we started a, a cross-cultural training and that really helped in the beginning so the volunteers understood who was coming here and the diversity of uh, Alaska natives that were represented and um, you know just to enrich the volunteers knowledge and uh, that that really helped too with the welcome and so anyway it took a lot of people and and we've gotten better at it um, the communications committee does a great job and you know, working with local and statewide media to prepare, and yeah. So it's been, it's been a great experience. Oh. And, you know, it's beyond economic development. That's really what we're about, right, is bringing, bringing people that are going to spend their money in our community. But the amount of work and the passion behind AFN here, it's so much more than that. You know, to represent the interior, to 
um, the rest of um, the members of um, AFN, you know, is just a great honor. And I think all of us feel that way. So it's way beyond, um, uh, you know, it, this gathering is really important to us as a community. Mm -hmm. Well, I just have to say you, you, you did a lot for that, and we just really appreciate that. You know, as you leave Explore Fairbanks after 21 years and you think of what you've done, what you've accomplished, what do you hope will happen in the next 10, maybe 10 to 15 years within the tourism industry? Yeah, th thanks for asking that. Um, you know, I think for Fairbanks, we have a really different product than a lot of um, the rest of Alaska. So uh, differentiating us and continuing to diversify our, our visitor base, I think, is really important. And I think if you ask me what's one of my disappointments is um, we don't have a bona fide convention center. And we worked, we had over 10 years, we did three studies and spent about $200,000 on that study, on those studies. And we still haven't been able to realize it, but we've definitely demonstrated that there's a market demand for a convention center in Fairbanks. And I really think that that is a tool in the toolbox that the community really needs. And um, I think we would be able to really round out the year-round tourism because spring and fall are really big convention months, and I think that we could grow that and just really even out um, visitation throughout the year. So I, I hope that the work that we've done provides a base for that to happen. Um, of course, now during this pandemic, as we've put that aside because it's not a great time to talk about a major project and a heavy lift, but um, I hope that, we, that it gets revitalized and it's discussed. Mm -hmm. So throughout your career, um, you know, you've been a role model to many, you know, people observing how you've led the organization and, and uh, what you've done for the community. Um, and for someone to come from, all the way from the East Coast up to a state she's never been to. What kind of advice would you give to our younger folks about um, starting off their careers? And what would you advise, um, you know, what's your advice to them yeah. about starting oh, a career? I, I think maybe we'd all probably say the same thing. And, um, you know, I think a lot of success is discipline. You know, um, you have to discipline yourself to the hours and the organization that's needed to succeed. And that, whether I was a 26-year-old or I'm a 66-year-old now, that same discipline needs to be, you know, applied. And certainly organizational skills that you can keep track of your projects. And then, um, you know, I think when you're younger, it's a good time to start showing your managers that you have some vision, that you're thoughtful. And, um, you know, I have, over the years, I've had a lot of employees bring forward ideas to me, but they're not thought out. But when somebody comes to me and says, hey, this is what I think, because I've done this research, I've looked at this, and I think we can do this, that is a wonderful thing for your manager to hear, right? That you've really thought it out and put budget to it, right? Put, put the budget to it for you. And um, I think you can do that. Um, even if it's a small project, uh, as long as you've thought it out and you can bring it forward in a logical, reasonable way, um, I think that's welcomed. And it really speaks highly of a young person when they do that. Mm -hmm. So you're leaving in June. You're not retiring. <laughs> but what will you be doing after you leave Explore Fairbanks? Yeah, I hope to, you know, have a consultant business. I've, I've done that before for a, at a juncture and... Uh, I hope I hope to do that. Um, I have to say, people say, what are you going to do on June 1st? And I'm like, I can't really get beyond <laughs> sleeping for maybe a week or two. So I think I'm going to, I think I'll do that too. Uh, but yeah, I would love to, um, I'm trying to think of business names. I think I may have one. Uh, but really, uh, I'm really strategic. You know, I really like helping people through processes and um, uh, co the collaboration that it takes for success. And um, I'm hoping I can have some projects where I can put those skills to use. Before we close, is there anything that you'd like to add that we may have missed about your career or just yeah. being a resident of Fairbanks? Yeah, it's it's been great. You know, I'm my I came with my 4-year-old 
my four-year-old daughter. So my daughter's adopted from China, and she was four months old when I adopted her. And then, so I plucked her from China at four months, and then I say I plucked her from Pennsylvania to Alaska at four years. Um, but she loved growing up in Alaska. Uh, she, she loves being from Alaska. I mean, it gave her a lot of street cred. And I think in a lot of ways she doesn't realize how unusual her childhood was. Well, first of all, that she grew up in Alaska. And second of all, with a single working mom. And she sacrificed a lot of her childhood, I think, as part of it. Like, she didn't do an after-school activity. She only did one that she could walk to, right, from middle school or from uh, high school because it had to fit in. I didn't have time to be chauffeuring around. So she, she made a lot of her own sacrifices. And, um, boy, I really feel a tribute to um, our children who come along for the ride with us sometimes when we have our careers. And um, hopefully they're, we hope and pray that they're the better for it, too. Uh, I know she's, got, she's very determined and very um, organized herself. So I, I hope that that. So anyway, I want to thank her that it, and that you've given me an opportunity to do that because um, I think she's... She gave up a lot and um, was very supportive of what I did. And, um, wow. yeah, and the community's been great. I mean, it's been, um, you know, when you talk to people one-on-one -on -one and um, you can have a reasonable conversation with somebody, uh, they inform what I'm doing, and then it helps me inform them about what we're doing. And even people who are naysayers to begin with, they can really really come around, I think, in Fairbanks. I think they really respect if you have an idea and, it's, and um, you work with people to bring it forward that there's some mutual respect going on there, right. which has been fun. Well, thank you for talking to us. It's been a pleasure to hear about your um, career and what you've done for the community, and we just wish you all the best in your future endeavors. Um, I know we'll see you around, but... Thank you, too, for all that you've done. Really oh, thank you, it. Sharon. But, you know, working with you and like, people like you has been what it's all about. And um, so thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. And we hope you've enjoyed this discussion and conversation with Deb Hickok, uh, outgoing CEO of Explore Fairbanks.